Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Ask Me Anything. Let's talk diversity, inclusion, and race, part two, featuring alumna expert, Dr. Portia Newman. And I know we had a lot of questions, um, especially from last year asking if, you know, is part one was recorded or, you know, did I have to be a part of part one? No, you did not. These are questions. These are new questions that a lot of you all submitted or questions that weren't able to get to. So don't worry. Part one is completely separate from part two. Um, hello, though. My name is Leticia Taylor Smart, and I am the Director of Alumni Career and Personal Development with VCU Office of Alumni Relations, and I will be moderating today's event. Um, so like I said, as some of you all did join us last year at what seemed to be the height of many racial disparities um, impacting many lives, the conversation and learning around this topic um, was much needed. However, we wanted to make sure that it didn't stop there, right? You know, there are continued challenges and around diversity and inclusion, and they call for continued questions and conversations. So we're super excited to have Dr. Portia with us this afternoon uh, to help us with that uh, follow-up conversation. So before we get started, I would like to thank those that were able to submit question, questions for today's event. We will try to get to as many questions submitted as possible, uh, but feel free to submit questions via the Q&A pane of the control panel um, that you should see at the bottom of your screen. So if you submit them via the Q&A pane, we can definitely leave those anonymous. We want this to be an open, honest discussion and conversation. Um, and as we get through some of the pre-submitted questions, and I think Dr. Kosher will allow some you know, questions to be submitted throughout, uh, we will continue with questions that have been submitted during the event. Um, so. For some housekeeping points, uh, we will be recording this afternoon's event. So don't worry if you blink a little too hard and miss a few seconds of the discussion, a recording will be available. Um, there's also live closed captioning that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you're having a hard time accessing that feature or seeing it, message me for assistance. Um, I also ask that if you have not already done so, if you're just joining us this afternoon, if you plan on contributing to the conversation in the chat to please change your chat feature to display to everyone so that we can all engage in what we are contributing. So. Without further ado, I would now like to formally introduce you all to our alumna expert, Dr. Portia Newman. Dr. Portia Newman has 10 plus years of experience and is a lifelong learner and believes in the power of education. Portia's background in child development and instruction complements her work with innovative programming and informs her service as an educator, researcher, and learning and leadership development professional. Portia serves as a strategic par program partner, facilitating equity-focused initiatives critical to scale and advance organizational efforts. As a founder and education consultant of PN Consulting, Portia is committed to addressing issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and opportunity through a racial equity lens. Through timely, relevant, and radical efforts, Dr. Portia supports districts, organizations, and leadership teams with strategy, training, and program design and support. Portia believes in the possibilities of this work and in the responsibility we have as leaders to facilitate change within ourselves and our professional spaces. Dr. Portia earned her BA in education from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill before earning her master's in education and instructional leadership and educational Pro policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She earned her PhD right here in educational leadership policy and justice program with Virginia Commonwealth University. In her leisure, Portia loves to read, being with family, and exploring the world of wine. Who does not love to do that? Uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Sounds good, Dr. Portia? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, perfect. I am ready. Perfect. So one of, and we've broken it down into three categories uh, for you all to It'd be best to follow through with us this afternoon. So this category is more along the lines of definitions and key terms. Um, so the question that was sent in is, which aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion do you feel requires more emphasis with regards to embracing their respective meanings and application? 
Yeah, so I'm so glad we're starting off with some basic key terms. Uh, and I say that because when you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we can also add to that list, right? Social justice, anti-racist, belonging. I can kind of add all the different buzzwords that we've seen pop up. When you think about all those words, one thing that I think we've done in the last year and a half, in the last two years, if you will, is really lump those together, right? How often every everybody's DEI, I've seen JEDI lately, um, equity, diversity, this. What's important, I think, just to understand is that one does not happen without the other, right? So we could talk a lot about diversity by people, by race, by gender, by ability. We could talk about equity and what that looks like in our policies and practices. But the reality is if we're going to address issues of equity, we also must address issues of diversity. And the same thing with inclusion, right? When you think about bringing in a diverse group of people or creating a diverse culture within a workplace or organization, inclusion still is a major factor. And so when you think about the individual definitions, I think, yes, we should all have like uh, understanding of that and a practice toward those things. But what, the big question is, what do you do when you've started to address diversity, right? How is it valued? Which I think speaks to how we think about equity or inclusion. We then can ask questions around like, how does it impact or connect to equity or where does inclusion happen or not? And so instead of like trying to think about these as individual terms, I would really think about them as connected and interrelated, right? So think about addressing our workplace environment with a puzzle. So diversity, equity, and inclusion, if you have others belonging, anti-racist, whatever, um, think about it as puzzle pieces and not just one particular lever that we need to pull in order to move the work forward. That's great. I like the the puzzle reference. I think that helps, especially as we a lot of times we talk about this word intersectionality. I don't mean to bring a, another key term um, to this conversation, but I think that helps us to better understand it. So, yeah, that's great. Um, again, if you all have questions to, you know, Dr. Portia's responses or in any engagement that you want to happen, feel free to post it in the chat. Um, or in the Q&A if you do want to remain anonymous in that aspect. So we're going to jump to another question that someone submitted. So there seems to be mixed thoughts and opinions around the newly coined term BIPOC, which I'm glad that we're actually talking about this because I don't I even want to say even when we did this event last year, I wouldn't say it was as widely used. Mm -hmm. um, and so could you give any perspective around that term and how is it different from POCs, which is people of color? Um, well, I'll let you explain the terms. Um, when should it be used and when shouldn't it be used? Yeah, so one thing, I think educators are really good at this, right? Um, and I also see this in my work now is that we've got an acronym for everything, okay? An acronym for everything. Um, when you think about BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous, People of Color, right, it became uh, this language that we use to think, think about folks in first person, right? It helps us to get away from some of those broad general terms that I think often have like a deficit approach. So when we call people minorities or we often underrepresented groups, right? Um, we can see those shifts in those words too when you perhaps are talking to scholars or academics who might be identifying the same BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color as historically and presently marginalized, or people describe those communities as disinvested communities, right? So it allows us to think about the person and, and not create the problem and make it the person's problem, right? So that's the first thing. So Black, Indigenous, people of color becomes this really broad term for Black, or BIPOC rather, for Black, Indigenous, people of color. Then you've got POC, which I think has been around a little bit longer. Um, it is super general people of color, which is a general term often describes anyone who's non-white. And what we know is that non-white people or people of color all have very different experiences in the world and in the workplace. So I've seen this um, used in broad strokes when in actuality, we might be talking about a particular group. And so the question here is, right, could you give us a perspective around the terms and when should it be used? Here's what I, here's my rule of thumb. I try to be super thoughtful and say what I mean. Right. If I'm talking about the inequities or lived experiences of a group and I am generally saying people of color, you can then assume 
who I'm talking about. You can make up assumptions, you can guess, you can use context clues, but my rule of thumb is to say what I mean. So if I mean Black folk, that's what I mean, right? If I mean Latinx folks in the Latinx community, that's what I mean, and I try to push myself to say that. The reality is it gets a little testy, right? Some of us like are still tiptoeing around the word Black. Some of us are still tiptoeing around racial identification. I want us to get away from that. And I say that because if we get used to using broad terms as we have minorities, unrepresented, people of color, then we never force ourselves to get specific in our data, in our research, in our metrics, and in our discourse around certain populations, right? So there are questions that were posed around like, what should we be doing in the workplace for folks of color? Well, what a Black person in your job might need is very different from someone who might be living with a, a learning difference or a disability, right? So I want us to say, you know, hey, if we mean a particular population, we should just name it. That's If you are considerably talking about non-white people, then people of color exactly might be the, the right terminology. Um, but this is just an opportunity for us to really talk about race, right? Center the language around race and normalize a conversation and being specific around if it's research, right? Who we're measuring, if it's in our workplace, who we're, who we're serving and getting really specific about that. So there's some some engagement and some some agreements in the chat, right? So Alexia saying being direct, I like that helps to unmask the confusion face daily. Yeah. Um, and so that is so true. We should be specific in the who we are talking about being clear. And I, I like that point about even thinking about it being clear in regards to data and you know what we're collecting because a lot of times um you know we might put this label on you know we're collecting this information on people of color but do we really mean a specific race within that exactly that term? yeah yeah, exactly. yeah even when you think about like outputs too right so um in our workplace we're like oh we're collecting this data so we can understand the experiences of minorities right at our organization mm -hmm. well, who do we mean? And right. if we're getting really clear about what we want to do next, we have to name what those populations are. That I think is probably the hardest thing because in, in <laughs> sometimes we collect our data and we see that we've dropped the ball, right? Mm -hmm. Or we look at our data and we're like, wow, we have we've actually not been serving a particular community well. Then yeah. we're become responsible. And that's the work I care about. Like, how do we become both accountable and responsible leaders? And that starts with like being able to normalize saying what we mean. Like, do we mean we're serving a certain population? If so, how and why? And yeah. calling it Black, calling it Latinx, calling it a, a group of folks um, who might be living with a disability. There's, we can run the spectrum here. But I do agree that I think just getting super direct on that is really important for us to do our work well. Yeah, like Priscilla said, if you don't know the generality or the proper tone of others, how do you respond without offense? So Yeah, that's a good question. Like, there's also a debate too, right? Are people black? Are they African American, right? Yeah. Um, at my current company, we use both. So every time they're saying black African American as a, a population recognize that people have different uh, or identify with different names. Here's the thing: you can just ask, right? Yeah. You can say, hey, I want to look at our data of uh, people of color, and then get specific. Okay, actually, I mean this particular population. We should name that all of those folks who might identify as Black or African American might have different stories to tell. No one, you know, no one group is a monolith. So I think that allows you to ask very specific questions, and you can do that in a curious way. With yeah. and that helps to think about intent, right? Hey, I want to be thoughtful about what I'm naming. Here's who I'm talking about. If there's a proper term we would like to agree on, can right. we? Yeah. For sure. I did want to do like kind of a follow up question to that because I've been hearing just I, I would say from my my personal friend group, my personal network. Um, and so when it comes to the term BIPOC, I just feel like a lot of um, those that are in my, my personal network that are black aren't really feeling the term or, you know, maybe it's because don't know as much or not really you know informed as much you know have you been hearing a lot of that like people just that the term I guess is supposed to be for and not actually embracing the term yeah so we could probably debate difference of opinions um here what I will say is it is a it's terminology mm -hmm. we have the agency to own terminology as we see fit so I don't think there's a right or wrong here. Like as a black person, should I also use BIPOC? 
I personally try not to use it because it's so easy to conflate all the things together when we actually mean or are trying to be specific about a particular population. So that's my personal choice, right? So I try not to lump people and also get really specific when I say Black folk, right? Recognizing we have a number of different experiences because of things like colorism, because of things like a tokenism, things we've been socialized around. So, so my experience being a Black person in a certain environment could be different than yours based off of what that environment is. Yeah. Uh, so there's, I think people just have agency there in, in how they use it. I will say if you're um, running an organization or thinking about the culture within your company, your workplace, right? I think you can open that up to the folks in the room, right? Hey, we're going to use Black, Indigenous, people of color. And in the data that we're collecting and the policies that we're making, are we, do we really mean all of those groups? Yeah. If not, then maybe that's not the right term. So I think yeah. there's agency there. That's great. Great. Okay. So again, thank you all for engaging with us in the chat. If you're just tuning in, if you want to engage with us in the chat, go ahead and change that chat feature to everyone so everyone can see your comments and what you're saying so that this can be a full uh, rounded discussion. So we're still on definitions and key terms. This is a, a lengthy one. Uh, so I'll try to read it slowly for us. But speaking of diversity, could you speak a bit about intersectionality of identities? Um, so race, ethnicity, ability, religion, age, sexuality, and orientation. Specifically, how can we all do better to recognize these factors and not overshadow or minimize one over the other? Um, often people with disabilities are pushed aside for another narrative ism. And I hear many conversations from people that identify in varying groups that they feel limited to one identity at a time as they hang out with that particular community. Yeah, I'm going to start. Let's start with the resources, right? Okay. <laughs> um, let's start there. One, if you haven't read Dr. Beverly Tatum's work, right? Why do all the Black kids sit together in the cafeteria? I think that's a really interesting approach to understanding why certain groups of people might choose to be in, right, community with their folks. That does not take away from their other identities. That is one that they want to nurture in some cases, right? Find rest in some cases, so that's okay. Um, if you, if any of our alums are like working in the corporate world, I just recently read John Graham's uh, book on, it's called The Plantation Theory, and it basically looks at the experiences of Black professionals in corporate America. Um, and one of the things that he talks a lot about is like, what is the right point for us to bring in our, to your point, spectrum of identities? And in what ways do our workplace environments allow that or not? So I'm just going to throw those two resources out there and get back to the question. So the question here is like, I, I underscored it. How can we do better? Well, here's the thing. D diversity work, identity work is super complicated, right? Whether we're talking about our identity in the workplace or our homes and our communities, there's not just one. Who we are as a people, we can just kind of create a long list, right? And we can own those at different points in time. Those identities are developed at different points in times, right? So also recognizing that sometimes those identities are visible to others and other times there are things that we perhaps don't share at the workplace. Uh, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work, right, around intersectionality really helps us understand and gives us the language to explore the sociopolitical identities and how they connect and engage us around both discrimination and privilege, right? So with certain identities, how do they show up or not? How do people perceive them, good or bad, or, or whatever the, the, um, the experiences there is? But what I would start by saying is, I would suggest first, first thing first, let's get comfortable with our own intersectional identities, right? So before trying to like pick and choose or judge people for what they're choosing to show or not, we got to get comfortable with who we are, right? I'm Black and woman. I am, you know, I've earned a terminal degree. So that offers me a certain level of privileges, right? And being an academic, being a scholar is a part of my identity. I have a learning difference, right? I also grew up Southern Baptist. And so from a religious standpoint, right? absolutely has everything to do with how I engage with people. Um, and I can keep going. I can keep running you the list of all these things. There are points 
both in my personal and professional journey, that those identities are more salient than others, right? And I say that because I wasn't always comfortable sharing that I had a learning difference. And I also learned about it, you know, two years into college, where I thought being a student, being a good student was my identity. That looks different for me now. So when I talk about evolving identities, I think when I think about myself as an academic and a scholar, that is a lot more complex than it used to be. Um, I think it's also important to think about, right, some identities being more prevalent, like, for example, being Black and woman in certain spaces really works for me. Some places it does not, and we all know that, right? Because that is where bias and microaggressions and stereotypes come in. Um, but depending on that experience for each of us individually, we might choose to pull, you know, lean into or lean or lean away from. We talk a lot about like code switching. I'm not gonna go on a soapbox about that, but that's a choice, right? It's a thing that we do to help navigate those instances where our identities might create a barrier or not. Um, a lot of my research focuses on Black women in uh, leadership and particularly thinking about the influence of race, gender, and culture on how we develop our leadership skills and practices. And, I, and one of the things that I talk a lot about are those inherent skills around communication, around how we engage with people. I tell people another part of my identity is that I'm a cousin. I'm from a small town and it's a lot of us. Okay, y'all, it's I have thousands of cousins. That's, I think that's the real number, thousands. Um, and so I identify from a family orientation often, right? And that's how I think about my teens. That's how I think about the people I engage in. So number two, we've got to understand the perception of those identities, right? And that those that perceptions shift or change based off our environment. And when we choose to share, also maybe influence our environment, right? So people find similarities and want to connect. Number three, we've got to normalize being both and. That's just what it is, right? I know that at the beginning that like, I got a terminal degree, but I'm also first generation. First generation college grad, master's earned PhD, first generation out of poverty, first generation to make a livable wage. All of that gets super confusing in my head sometimes, but I get to be both and, right? I get to be a community leader and an auntie and a sister and a friend girl. I get to be all those things in all of the places that I want to see them show up or, or not, right? So I would just say we've got to normalize having lots of identities at work and at home and recognize how those identities really contribute to the space and places that we occupy. And we get better by getting comfortable with who we are first. That is wonderful. And of course, kudos have been given to you. Congratulations for all of those accomplishments. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and also to... Dr. Portia shared a lot of different resources. I tried to put um, all the links that she shared. Um, so I think I was, I think I did it in a speedy enough time. Um, but if there are any others, um, I'll try to get those to you all after the event. Um, and in no way am I endorsing Amazon. That was just the fastest link that I could get for some of the books. Um, but yes, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Portia. All right. So if there, well, did you want to maybe stop here and see if there were any questions? Yeah, we can. Okay. So this is, this was really around the category of definitions and key terms for those that are in the room. Um, so if there are any you know, lingering questions or things that, you know, you all have questions on that's maybe about what we've talked about or, you know, you were hoping to hear about this certain definition or key term, um, please let us know um, in the chat or the q and I did see that somebody had raised their hand. If you don't mind um, chatting the question, um, if you can, that would be awesome. So if there are any questions, I'd like to give a so we do have a question. Um, my company, Giovanni says, my company just had a discussion on intersectionality. What might be some ways we can consider intersectionality in our day to day? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, like I said, intersection, intersectionality allows us to consider multiple identities at once and how they engage or connect to experiences around discrimination and privilege, right? Um, where you can think about intersectionality. I think about this like with um, employee resource groups or affinity groups, right? I can be in a group uh, or a community of Black folk, but I could also be in a community of women, right? I could also choose to be in a community um, of folks who identify as LGBTQ plus 
because I'm an ally, right? So you could think about it like in terms of circles and relationships, right? So what does it mean to be, I don't know, male and uh, and Latino, right? And in a particular space, how does that show up? Or male, Latino, and someone with a learning difference, what, how does that show up? You could think about that on the day-to-day in terms of how you engage teens. Um, one of and I will be thoughtful here and make a list of all these resources that I keep coming to my mind. Um, I am thinking about a particular PDF document written by uh, Dr. Tima Akun, who does a lot of workshops around diversity, equity, and inclusion and intersectionality. And this particular PDF, and I promise to share it with you, um, it's, it's set up very neatly, right? And so on one side of that PDF, it says, here's how we describe white dominant culture, not white people, white dominant culture. We're talking, we're talking about the experience of the workplace, right? And here are our are, are alternatives, right? And that right side of that document allows us to explore ways we can communicate differently, ways we can engage teams differently. How do we build consensus? And because what we know, uh, communities of color, specifically Black and Latinx, are really uh, collective people groups, right? So we engage community a lot. So I think there are some ways when you think about building relationships, when you think about some of the policies, when you think about some of the practices on like building consensus or um, shared leadership, those things really consider uh, intersectionality, right? So just because, excuse me, just because I am um, a woman or black, right? Or someone with a learning difference, I should be thinking, and a leader, I get to think about how all those things show up in our, our meeting spaces, but I'll, send you that document um, once this is over. That's perfect. Yeah. So again, like I said, um, I'm going to put together all the resources that were talked about so we can send it out um, after the event. So there's another question that came through. And then after this question, we are going to move on to the next category um, from Trevor. There seems to be such a visceral reaction to terminology and how people identify. How do you think that we can mitigate really strong oppositional reactions or actions? That's a good question. Um, one, I think you can start by just like opening the conversation, right? Hey, we're gonna start with this word terminology. I wanna see how people respond. How does this land with you? If you're working in a community space or within your office, perhaps you're serving a population of students or adults for that matter, you might want to consider the folks that you're serving to and allow them to weigh in. This does feel like a really uh, kind of intertwined process. But one of the things to like mitigate how people respond is to understand why people are responding as such, right? So for some people, it might be who's calling them those things. For some people, it's maybe because they've not wrestled with how they sit with a particular definition um, and giving folks space, right, first to say, hey, I really agree with this term or not. So back to, for example, BIPOC, right? My company tries to use that every now and then, and then other people only use people of color. What I, instead of having a visceral reaction, I always say, hey, I want to raise that those are really broad terms. Can someone help me be specific about who we're really talking about? Oh, Black and African-American? Okay, great, thank you. Oh, we're talking about Native Indigenous people right now? Okay, let's say that. And so I would just encourage, um, whether you're a leader, whether it's a group of people, is to really just sit down and have a conversation about the terminology, how you all see it. And if you're serving a particular population that you'll be referencing, allow them to weigh in. Um, and that way you get a better understanding of why people are responding the way they are and can mitigate that by saying, all right, they don't like this coming from this population of people. So maybe this should be the most appropriate terminology. Perfect. Sorry, I'm trying to get off mute here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Portia. So we are going to move on to company organizational culture. So I feel like we've been leaning into this um, already a little bit. So this is great. Um, what would you say are the main ingredients needed when trying to start a DEI program at work? How do you measure effectiveness? So maybe for any of our managers or leaders in the room or somebody who's been tasked with this, you know, what would you say are the main ingredients? Yeah, can I start by saying uh, thumbs up, sending hugs, extending grace to folks who do this every day on a daily, okay? Um, and I say that because this work is super hard, right? And if we're doing this work well, 
This is my personal opinion. We should be working ourselves out of a job, right? If all the folks leading the DEI committee, leading the program, chief of staff, whatever, we should be working ourselves out of job. And that's because to answer, to answer this question, I don't think there is no ingredients list to a particular program, right? Perhaps the better question is, how do we better integrate DEI efforts into our work? So this work cannot be separate if we intend to be successful. We cannot have 800 DEI committees, 7,000 people getting unpaid to do extra work to fix the policies and systems that our company has always stood by. That cannot be the answer. We actually have to say on the front end that we must be intentional and strategic, right? And direct when we think about things like equity and inclusion in the design of our policies and practices, right? So what I will say is, a DEI program could be a number of things, right? We could be talking about um, learning and development. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people on this call who have now gone through 18 versions of an un unconscious bias training, okay? Everybody got to do that now because that's the thing. And it's, it's a part of their learning and development. Similarly, for folks who are, are do talent, right? Somebody's thinking about a diverse strategy for, you know, tapping into Black and Brown talent across the world. Listen, listen, I think that if we're going to do this work right, that it can't be separate, right? We can't have a separate strategy from our primary recruiting strategy to only get black and brown people. Do I think we need to be innovative about how we approach? Yes, but it can't be separate. So I will say this, in both of those examples, my approach is to think about being integrated into current systems and policies. So if you're going to train people on bias, this the metric then cannot be, did you go to the training or not? What we should be looking for are behavior shifts right? It needs to be a part of the learning strategy or the development path for everyone because we know that bias impacts our work at multiple levels. It really impacts our practice, right? It has a lot to do with like how we see our roles and ourselves on the team. If the program, for example, is around recruitment, hey, we can't just say we're going to go to these HBCUs moving forward and recruiting talent. First of all, that is not where all our black and brown folk at. That's, we go to all the schools actually, right? So effectiveness and accountability must be measured with change in behaviors that ultimately change outcomes. So if you're thinking about a new sourcing strategy that includes diverse sourcing pipelines, cool. I wanna know where you're recruiting from and how those numbers are moving from application to interview slate to extended offers, right? But when you couple that with like having your hiring managers and people on the team understand how bias interrupts the hiring process, we can mitigate that, right? By saying, okay, a part of this hiring process is that our hiring managers have to participate and engage in this way. Our recruiting managers have to have a change in behavior. And then we should see a difference in who we're bringing into the organization. So if you're thinking about integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into your work, consider the outcomes that you want, right? What are those behavior shifts? That's how you measure the effectiveness of whatever that particular change in practice or policy is. Is it a representation increase? Is it access to opportunity? Measuring for outcomes um, really helps us really think about uh, accountability. Right. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's something that we always think about, right? Is like, how can we, you know, or we think we're doing something new. Like we need to start a DEI initiative. We need to start a DEI program and that's going to solve whatever problem there is here. And that's mm -hmm. not the case is, you know, how do you integrate it in this effortless effortlessly being integrated into your everyday work. That's yeah. great. There will be a there will be a little bit of a stumbling blocks, right? Because this is going to be so new for people, like being intentional about that. So yeah. I don't expect any one organization or workplace environment to get it right because there is some learning, right? Yeah. There's some things we got to unlearn. Maybe that's right. the right unlearn before we can do it differently. But the idea is that we're getting intentional and strategic on the front end of design of our policies and practices. Um, and that's that's where we have to start. Yeah, for sure. And having the right people in place that do get paid to do it and, you know, have the knowledge and expertise um, to help. Don't us. Sorry, I have <laughs> like, not the right people. I'm also of the camp that when you make, I don't know if people have grappled with this, the definition of like equity and equality, right? Uh, that to me is is important to understand. So when we think about equity, we're still 
considering, right, what could be an unequal distribution or allocation of resources or investments to make sure folks get what they need. I feel the same around roles and roles and leadership, right? Hey, if you're not the right person, if you're not able to practice things like diversity, understand equity, consider inclusion, then you might not be the right, you might have to go. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about not, not work, but we've got to have leaders across the board who understand these concepts as intentional and by design. We yeah. cannot, we actually can't run the risk anymore of having folks who are pushing certain concepts to the side or not being super clear about what those outcomes and behavior shifts are because we put ourselves in a, in a circle and we're back to having committees to do the work. So I'm really looking for leaders who are, are, are serious, right, about getting this work done. And if you're not that leader, perhaps that's not your role. Maybe yeah. you need to adjust. Alex, Alexia described it as band-aiding. Absolutely. We we saw a lot of that right after um, the passing of, of George Floyd, right? We saw yeah. a lot of circles, I mean, squares on the Instagram. We saw yeah. a lot of, I'm sorry, notes from companies and organizations, the same yeah. Organizations who's yet to still have a solid DEI policy statement. So don't get me started. Yeah, band aids all over. And that's yeah. just my fault. All right. So we're going to stay on this topic of company organization and culture. Do you feel it's the responsibility of Black people to educate the dominant culture about microaggressions, racism, et cetera? My short answer is no. Okay, and that's the nicest way I could say it. Absolutely not. Uh, I think there's just way too much internet, podcasts, musical selections, videos, TikToks, you name it, that people can do their own work, right? You can Google at this point. If you go back and look at the New York Times bestseller um, list, there's so many books for people to read. You want a short book, go read the Atlanta. You want an article, like, no, we no. You're not responsible. What I will say, though, what I will say, is that there are some instances where the opportunity presents itself, and we, and by we, I mean black people, right, make the choice to educate, and that's okay, right. My point is, you have the agency over that, and you can choose to engage or not. My only ask is that you're clear about what you want the outcomes to be. If you're getting yourself in the wheel of an argument, walk away, walk away. That's not what we want. But yeah. if you're clear about like how you taking the ownership and educating folks will get you from point A to point B, I think that's totally appropriate. I say that because I have one friend who's an academic, a scholar, an activist, and she always chooses no. I'm always impressed by how she's like, yeah, girl, we had a DEI meeting today. I was off the video. She does not right play. Thing. She chooses not, right? Not to do it. But the point here is that she has the agency to say right. no. Right. Yeah. What I will layer that with, because I think this is the most important part to this question besides saying no, is that if you choose to, right, if you do or, you know, make the choice to, to engage, take care of yourself. The psychological unsafety that is experienced when engaging folks around these things is so strong, right? Whether you're witnessing it firsthand, whether it's happening to you, right? What happens after the fact, how black folk have to go in a corner and process and think and navigate and move is so much. I just hope people are finding ways, A, to extend ourselves grace and to get help if we need help processing or healing yeah. from that particular experience. So I'm going to tell you, no, it's not our responsibility. But if, in fact, you choose, I either way, I hope you're taking care of yourself. That's yeah. that. Yeah, that's so necessary because we've been in this and at this for most Black people their entire lives. Yeah. It, is, it has gotten bigger, right, as the world has woken up to all the things that are, that are happening. But what I care about is how are we healing? Do we take the time off? Do we take the time to step back? And I, I would say the same too about folks who are engaging in DEI committees. I'm saying this as a DEI professional, right? Like some days I have to be like, hey, y'all. Wednesday's off the calendar because I got to think yeah. or in therapy. Hey, therapist, this is a wild week this week yeah. <laughs> we have to process these things. So what I really care about is that people are taking care of themselves. Yeah. I, and I love um, someone said black people have the choice, not the responsibility. The um, so yes. that's great. And that yeah. goes for any race, culture, isn't like whatever right like you have the choice in that in that battle as Alexia describes it it's hard it's hard because yeah. I think sometimes we naturally are inclined to 
to, to say something, right? Yeah. To be on the defense, to, to be ready to explain. But in this day and age, people got to go read their own book, check out a yeah. TikTok, a meme. It's, it's a lot of too many clips floating around here that can yeah. get together. And then we don't have to necessarily be responsible to do that. Most definitely. Perfect. Great. All righty. So we're now shifting to a, a different category. So um, I don't know if anybody had any lingering questions on company, organization, culture that wasn't, um, you know, responded to, or you're hoping that maybe we could discuss. If not, we might have to come back to it because we have a lot of questions in this next category, and I would love for us to get to some of them. Um, and again, if you do put them in the chat, put in the Q&A, we'll be more than happy to get to those. So this category is more along the lines of strategy, action, and accountability. So with the pressure to truly address system, systemic racism with regards to employers who say that they are aware and are addressing the issue, how can we as employees hold them accountable for the change? Yeah, that's a good question. I try to keep this brief. Um, the first thing here is, is my question always is, are our leaders, right, and our employers, are they really about this life, right? Because this, like, you, if you're thinking about what really needs to be overturned, there's a lot of work to be done. If the answer is yes, that our employees really are trying to do something different, then I would have them first thing determine what those outcomes are, right? What is the change that we will see as a result of whatever the, the change in policy or practice is? This creates a level of transparency and accountability for doing what they say they will do. So if, if employees are clear on what the outcomes will be, they can create systems to say, hey, we wanna check in. I've seen this done like town halls. I've seen this done in one-on-ones. I've seen this done with special committees like a DEI group, right? As accountability partners in the work. Um, but the transparency is gonna be what really involves uh, the how and the when, right? So if we know what we're getting at, then transparency allows us to say, okay, how do we do that? What are we going to do differently in order to see that particular change happen? And with this type of information, employees can monitor progress, right? They can say, hey, we started this journey six months ago on hiring new folks or creating a clear, uh, a clear process for career mobility. This is how we're removing bias in that process. Cool. Six months later, if we've not seen anybody move up, if we've not seen a change in our, our, our department representation wise, something's not happening. And so I think there needs to be a place then, right, where employees can say, hey, we said we we're going to do this and we didn't. Uh, different companies and organizations work on different cycles quarterly, you know, have every half year, whatever. But I think you have to make sense of the timeline based off of whatever the outcomes or, or changes you want to see. That's great. Yeah. And again, like you said, I mean, even from what last year, a lot of corporations putting out, you know, their statements or responses and things of nature, like looking at now and being 2021, are we going back and are we, I mean, just as a consumer standpoint, like, are we going back and seeing like, are they holding up their end of the bargain of what they said they were going to do? So. Listen, um, shameless plug here. If you've never checked out the plug, it is a digital media resource. Um, Sherelle Dorsey runs it. She's a journalist and does a lot of that work. In, in the height of the pandemic, she did some really cool research on like funders and investors in Black entrepreneurship and also corporations with um, large uh, population of, uh, of Black employees or Black associates and trying to understand like, okay, cool, what's the commitment and what have you done differently? She's got some really cool charts and graphics that might be helpful. Um, again, that's called The Plug. Uh, and the founder of that is Sherelle Dorsey. She's super fly. But that I think you're right. We've got to do that double check and get back to say, okay, you said you were going to do this. Are we seeing it? And if so, how and where? Right. I'm going to try to find it. Um, okay, well, I'll see. No okay, yes, 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 please, please, please. Um, I found her page, so I might have to just tag her in it, and there's a way you probably can get to that. All righty, so with our next question, um, structural racism has long, deep tentacles all across society, which inhibit the dismantling of racism overall. As a white woman, what would you advise I do to start the process of breaking down the walls of structural racism? 
Yeah, this gets back to the, the the comment I made earlier, right? I would actually flip this question and whoever submitted it, my question directly to you would be like, what have you already done, right? What are the things that you've already put in place? Um, here's the thing. There's a lot of, of uh, learning to, to be done in the world, right? Um, and the reality is there is no checklist. Sometimes we make structural, it is big. We make it seem like it's an impossible task. And so when I read this question, I was like, well, structural racism at the uh, micro level in the individual level is not an impossible task, right? As an institutional issue, it is, but we as individuals have agency and opportunity to make those changes, right? So it feels like a really big hill to climb, but I think there's some small things that we can all do individually that then collectively move the needle. Um, in 2000, the Aspen Institute had uh, gathered a whole bunch of researchers, academics, thinkers, you name it, right, to really define structural racism. And they talked about this system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often re, in various ways, often reinforcing uh, ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. It is the result of that that we see this kind of historically uh, uh, accumulated white privilege, national values, what we've seen in contemporary culture, and we, that has interacted in a way that kind of um, preserves these gaps between different groups of people in America. Here's the thing, as individuals, we can actually address public policy. We, we, can, we can challenge perspective and thinking on that. And so individually, I just think we've got to start asking bigger questions, really start challenging policies, getting into leadership, right? Getting into those positions that make or break those decisions, advocate for and organize around those systems and practices and policies that marginalize uh, specific groups. I just think we have to have a lot of, a lot of people at different levels and different positions, right? To really help us dismantle this. It's also making me think a little bit about Derek Bell's work around interest convergence. Um, and, and that just basically says very specifically like black people achieve civil rights, civil, civil rights victories only when white and black interests converge. And, and, and a, if you allow me to think about this in a broader scope, it pushes us to say, we can't do this work alone. Individuals must become a collective all from all shapes and walks of life with all backgrounds, interests, abilities, roles, positions in order to move this forward. That's the only way. Black people can't do it by themselves. My cousins and them can't do it by themselves. Individually, everybody on this webinar can't do it by themselves. We gotta do it together, right? Um, and so that's what I would say. I think there's a, a lot of collective work that we can be doing. And so to who, whomever submitted this question, my first question is what have you already done? And then think about those things and who you need to be in contact or in collaboration with to continue to move that forward. Perfect. So I thank you, Samantha. We were able to find the plug um, blog, and then I put an article that references the um, interest converge, convergence that Derrick Bell talked about um, on NPR. So if you want to take a look into that, that is in the chat. All right. So in an industry, and this person didn't necessarily say what specific industry, um, but in an industry that is dominated by white males with few people of color, with few people of color entering the industry, how do you increase diversity in that said industry? So I'm guessing, you know, and it, when we're thinking about an industry that, you know, obviously is dominated by white males or white, or white dominant, and there's not a lot of people of color, like how do you increase that diversity in the industry? Yeah, that's a good question. I was taking my notes around this and I wrote in big letters like how, right? How? I feel like I've been saying a lot for the last, I don't know, pick a time frame. Uh, been saying a lot about we got to get creative, right? But perhaps it's more simple than that. We are all talent magnets right? For whatever. We're, we all become these walking billboards for the things that we are involved in. In every industry, whatever your industry might be, we get to like our job and we get to tell people about it, right? We get benefits from our jobs and we can tell people about it. We have experiences at our job, good or bad, and we're going to tell people about it, right? We get to share our experiences and we can invite others to join. 
So if I am working at X place and I'm, I saw Shanita in the chat, so I'm gonna pick on her. I get to be like, oh, this actually is a good fit for Shanita, right? I can, I can bring her along. I can plug her in. I can have her meet somebody on my team. That, that we can all do. So if you're in a particular uh, organization or, or a company that you're saying is dominated by a particular group, then my question is going to be, what are those folks doing to be talent magnets? How are they broadening the circles of people, those social networks that they're in to bring in a different body of people? The thing about that is, is we've got to um, think about kind of where our networks sit, right? Whether it's where we went to school or where we like to hang out for leisure. And if those are homogenous spaces, then the likelihood of us being able to bring in new people that are not like us is going to be really hard, right? So we got to choose a different place. Like we got to think about our own personal strategy for diversifying our own worlds um, in order to do that, right? So a couple other things that, we, that I'll say about this is if you are you know, trying to get creative. When you think about bringing in new people, I'd encourage you to think about where you're bringing them in from, right? Is now in 2021, a four-year degree required? If it's not, where else can folks develop those skills and how do we use those as pools of people? For example, certification programs, our two-year colleges, how do we consider lived experience? Um, we can recruit at all of those, those places, boot camps, especially if you're going into tech, we can leverage our professional groups if you're in like a sorority or fraternity, or if you're in a nonprofit or a service or a service organization. There's lots of different networks of people that we can choose from that will help us diversify our, our, our businesses. Again, I don't know if this is more creative than it is strategic, but creating systems that also help eliminate the bias in those processes, right? So thinking about diverse interview panels so that we're not, if we're going into a, a company that is predominantly white male for the case of this question, how do we make sure we are diversifying those interview panels of people? And if there's only, you know, five or so black and brown people in your organization, if they're doing extra work, my favorite part of this is pay them. Um, and let's consider what the metrics and accountability are, right? To, to be able to measure what we're doing. And is it years of experience? Do we really need four years of school? I don't know, but I think we just have to get creative around how we're sourcing and the things that we're putting in place in an interview process and a hiring process to make sure everybody has a fair chance. That is wonderful. I am looking at the time. Um, so we have so many more questions that I wanted us to get to. Um, there was a question that came in. So maybe if we could focus on these two last questions, I, I really want to get to your last question that we have on the slide, but there's an anonymous question that came in and wanted to know your thoughts. So uh, we recently had a staff member who said something problematic in a meeting and no one felt comfortable addressing it in the moment. Is there language appropriate for the workplace to immediately address moments like these? We were all disappointed how it was not handled. Yeah, um, let's see. And no one felt comfortable. And by, when I see no one, that also means leadership didn't feel comfortable, right? Um, a couple of things. One, if in the moment, no one, you know, perhaps sometimes you have an expectation that someone will say something immediately. Let's be real, everybody's not confrontational, right? So that's okay. What I will say is I would think about a way if you have a personal relationship with someone on your team or someone in leadership to say, hey, this did not land well. I'm pretty confident I'm not the, the only person who saw that this did not get addressed. Can we consider, right, a, either a group conversation around how that or you leadership take the time to connect with that person individually? I'm not sure what the instance was. Um, but I would highly encourage someone to bring it up and just say, hey, this came up, this did not get addressed. Here's how it landed with me. I imagine that I'm not the same, the only person. Is there some, is there a way for us to address this as a group? And depending on what it is, if it was a, a language use or um, I don't know, if, if it felt like a, a bias or something like that, like I think there, some people need a little bit more education. You can always attach it to an article, right? Hey, I, I was reading this. I saw this example in our meeting the other day. We need to address it, um, if that is helpful. This is great. And I see some action going on in the chat. Um, so this is great. Love the idea of a book club or book clubs can be a good starting point for some. Okay, so I want to get to one last question that I really 
kind of, I didn't ask this question, but I thought it was really good. Um, but the question was, and because I think about this often, right, as, as myself, um, can you talk a bit about how you manage your social media and social activism as a working professional? Yeah, I can. Okay, <laughs> look, first of all, I don't, okay? I don't, I don't. I don't have a professional Twitter, probably because I can't use the interface, but I don't. Because the first thing is we can, let's not accept the idea that they are mutually excuse, exclusive, right? We can be both. Perhaps my professional life is my activism work, right? Um, and they don't necessarily have to be separate. If they are, for whatever reason, perhaps there are folks who have one life, right, at work and another life that's separate. That's why we have privacy settings, right? I will say, you need to be able to stand by whatever you put out on social media any place. That's the first thing. You need to be able to stand by that. Um, and I, I say this because I don't know if I'm the right person because I actually don't, I think I've done a good job of merging the two in a way that I think is appropriate. Again, choice and agency. Um, some people, especially a lot of scholars have like academic social medias and then they have like, or maybe don't have a personal or have a personal that's private. I think you, you got a couple choices there. What I will recommend that if you're concerned about separating your personal from your professional, um, use privacy settings. Be thoughtful about what you post and whatever you post, be, be okay with standing beside that. Um, but I think the, for me, in many cases, the messaging is the same, right? Like I can be like at the beach with my friends having wine and talking about Freire, right? I can talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and what, I don't know what people, take a selfie, like whatever people do, right? Sometimes <laughs> I do when my hair gets done. Like all those things can happen in the same place. I think it's about messaging and being able to stand by whatever it is you post. But that's why we have privacy settings. If you're really concerned about folks being in your business, or if you think those two worlds are so, so different, leverage them and that's okay and then there are some people who choose not to and it's just you're going to get what you're going to get no matter what and that's okay too yeah for sure again there's some a lot of great um engagement in the chat just talking about book clubs podcasts way easier to ask people to listen to so maybe that's something too that you might want to integrate into your workplace culture things of that nature um and then alexia says i personally believe that people are human and subject to their lives one must be able to own their actions because there will always be someone finding something negative in whatever you do yeah so you might as well just live happily right choose yeah. joy and whatever that looks like yes closer, closer or not for sure for sure well we are right at 12.59, and we did not even get to all of our questions, um, but that is totally okay, because I feel like we got to a lot of great ones, and a lot of great discussion was had, um, so thank you, Dr. Portia, for wow. your knowledge and expertise that helped in guiding our conversation. See, session three is already needed. <laughs> I feel like we just, we have to continue the conversation, I mean, because you know, what I said earlier, you know, on the webinar is that just because a lot of things happened last year, or a lot of racial disparities came up in the media last year, it doesn't stop. Like, it stop. it's not something that we just do for the sake of doing it. Um, and we hope also as, you know, within our alumni relations office that we can be, be more proactive in being able to provide more opportunities, initiatives, programs around this area. Um, and so I wanna thank you all for attending with us this afternoon. Um, within 24 to 48 hours, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to a short survey uh, to complete and resources that were shared today. So between myself collecting or getting them from Dr. Portia, I will make sure that I get those to share with you all. On behalf of the VCU Office of Alumni Relations and our amazing speaker and expert today, Dr. Portia, Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank yeah. you all so, so much.